Hey everybody, I'm James Fothery and I'm the author of The Giant Clams and Giant Clams in the Reef Aquarium. Now both of these books, they've got lots of pictures of live giant clams and giant clam shells in them and all of that stuff can help you identify these animals down to the species level. But I wanted to add to that, so I've created a few short videos for you and this first one is a primer. Now in this one I'm just going to go over the basic parts and features of giant clams that again can be used to help identify them down to the species level. And if you'll watch this one, you should be good to go for the rest. So, let's get going. Now, I have to assume that some people watching this might not know much of anything at all about giant clams. So, let me point out a couple of things before I go any further. If you don't know anything about them and you see a giant clam, like this big Tridacnagigus, you might not be exactly sure what you're looking at. It doesn't really look much like a clam, at least not a normal clam anyway. No worries though, if you look at where the arrow is pointing, it's pointed at this clam shell, which is similar to the shells of a lot of other clams. Now this one is covered with algae and a bunch of other junk and it's not very clean, but it is the clam shell and it's normal for it to have a bunch of stuff growing on it. And if you look at the arrow on the right, it's pointed at the fleshy part of the clam, which is called its mantle. Now this is actually the upper mantle or the siphonal mantle, but I'll just call it the mantle here. And if you know what to look for, almost any giant clam can be identified by looking at the nature of its shell and the appearance of its mantle. So I'm here to help you understand what to look for. Let's begin with basic shell features, which you can see on the right. I've used a few different shells of a few different species here, and I'll do the same with some video now. Let's start with folds and ribs. Okay, let's look at some folds and ribs, and I'll start with this Durassa shell. Now, see these waves in the shell? See how it's not just smooth? Well, these waves, those are folds. Right? They're not very pronounced on this shell, but they're easy enough to see. How about a baby Giga shell? See how the folds are a bit more pronounced? You can see them a little better on this juvenile, and they'll get larger and even more pronounced with age. Take a look at this much bigger Giga shell. See how the folds are much bigger and they're rather convex? Well, now we can definitely call these ribs. All right, there's still folds in the shell, but they're much more pronounced. How about this squamosina valve? Now, take a look at these ribs. Very well developed and kind of triangular, too. Let me show you another Durassa shell, one that's a bit bigger. Okay, I showed you that low folds can develop into pronounced ribs at times using those Giga shells as examples. But look at how this Durassa actually looks a bit smoother than the one from a minute ago. In this case, the folds actually got lower and less pronounced with age. I wouldn't call any of these ribs, really. Likewise, sometimes there are barely any folds, much less ribs at any age. Now, this is a typical Crocea shell, and it doesn't have much for folds at all. That's normal for this species, though. I guess the only other thing to say here is that the difference in a fold and a rib, it's a bit subjective. I mean, a pronounced fold and a low rib, that could really be the same thing. Next, we've got scoots. Now, several species don't have these features, or they may only have them when they're very young. But many species do have them, and they can vary in nature. However, before getting to those scoots, let me say a little bit about clam burrowing first. A few species of giant clam can actually stick some specialized tissue out of a hole in the bottom of the shell, and they use that tissue to create holes in rocks and in coral skeletons. Now, that tissue is called the pedal mantle, and it has the ability to dissolve its way into these things with acid. Now, some clams, like the maxima on the left, it'll only make something like a dent or a shallow burrow to live in, but croceas, like the clam on the right, now they can make deep burrows, and they commonly fit all the way down in their burrow with the top edge of the shell being pretty much even with the top of their burrow. Well, as they grow, they just keep making the burrow bigger and bigger. Okay, so that's enough about that for here. Now let's look at some scoots, and you'll see why I brought this up. Here's an excellent example of a shell with scoots. Now, this is a Noe shell, and it's got some really nice ones on it. Now, these aren't big. I'm going to show you some big ones in just a second. But you can see there are lots of them, and they're relatively tightly spaced. 
Also look at how they're only on the ribs. That's normal. Here's another good one. It's another no way shell with lots of small and tightly spaced scoots. But I did want to show you that sometimes they either don't form or they get broken off over time. Now take a good look at this one and take a look at this one. Notice the shells themselves are very similar, but almost no scoots, just a few. Now these are big scoots. This is a typical squamosa shell, and this species always has these big scoots, unless they've been broken off and when they're really young. They're thick too, and strong. And look at how widely spaced they are compared to those that were on the Noe shells. This is also normal for this species. And here's a smaller squamosa, but I just wanted you to see the same thing on a different specimen. Relatively large, thick, strong, and widely spaced scoots. And then we have Crocea. Now this is the shell of a clam that was living in the sea, and it was living in a burrow. I'll say more about burrowing in a minute, but for now it's enough to tell you that some clams can use acid to create a hole in rocks and in coral skeletons and then they live in the hole. So they oftentimes don't have any scoots at all, or they may have a few near the top of the shell if the top of the shell is sticking out of the hole a bit. Like this, see how this Crocea shell has a few scoots right up here at the top part of the shell? This one was probably living in a hole, but the very top part of the shell stuck out like this. So we've got a few scoots at the top, none on the rest. Next, we've got the upper margin, which is basically the top edge of the shell. See how well the valves of this crocea fit together? Now, this is the upper margin of the shell, and you can see that each valve is symmetrical to the other. In other words, the way they're shaped allows the shell to close up very tightly and seal itself up. Likewise, the valves of this same small Durassa shell are also sort of mirror images of each other. They fit together tightly, I'd say they are symmetrical to each other, and they can seal everything up. On the other hand, take a look at this big Giga shell again. Look at the upper margin here. In this case, the valves are not symmetrical with respect to each other, and they don't fit together nice and tight. In fact, when a Giga gets big, it can't seal up the shell at all. Look at the gaps between the valves. Look at how this projection on one valve kind of fits into this big open curve on this other valve. And again, there's these big gaps here, and those can't be closed up. For some species, this can be highly variable, though. Now, this Maxima shell, if we take a look at it, has symmetrical valves. They fit together very well, and you can see that this shell could close up tightly. If we look at another Maxima shell, you can see that the valves look quite different, though. Look at the upper margin. Now, in this case, the valves are not quite symmetrical to each other, and you can see little small gaps in between them when the shell is closed as tight as it can close. And the umbos are next, which are at the bottom of the shell. The umbos are pretty easy to figure out. It's this part right down here, which is just the oldest part of the shell down here at the bottom. You can imagine this Jurassic was only this big at some point in the past. And it has just added new material onto that bottom part of the shell over time. Now we've got the hinge and the hinge line. Now, I want you to take note that each half of the shell, each valve, uh, it fits together with the other one, and they're held together with a tough rubber-like ligament when a clam is alive. But I've soaked most of these shells in bleach to get them cleaned up, and most of the ligaments, they've been kind of dissolved away. So you won't really see them here like you would on a live clam or on an unbleached shell. Also down here at the bottom of the shell, we've got the hinge and the hinge line right here. If we take a look at the inside, here's the hinge. There are two hinge teeth. Then there are some slots on the other side over here that those hinge teeth fit into. It joins together like that. Okay, back on the outside again, we can see the hinge, and I've got the hinge line from here to here. Now, this Noe shell is very elongated, and if you take a look, you can see that the hinge line is only about one-third of the total length of the shell. Look at this Durassa shell, though. This shell is not elongated. It's quite symmetrical, 
would say it's fan shaped. And if we look at the hinge line in this case, it's about one half of the total length of the shell. And lastly, we've got the Bissell opening, which is the hole in the bottom of some shells. Let me explain a couple of things before I say any more about the Bissell opening, though. Now, with very few exceptions, all giant clams live attached to something like a coral or a rock when they're small. And a lot of them stay attached to something for life, you know, even when they're full grown. Some of them don't, though, and they may spend most of their adult life unattached and simply sitting on the bottom. So how do they stay attached to things? Well, they use a special organ called the Bissell organ to make some strands. And the strands are called Bissell threads. And the Bissell threads stick out of the hole in the bottom of the shell. Now, these threads, they're really strong and they can stick to stuff. They can adhere to corals and rocks and rubble and glass if you've got a clam in an aquarium. Uh, and they can even stick to other clams at times. And these threads are collectively called abyssus. So a lot of clams live bissily attached to something. Now, for this to happen, there has to be, again, a hole in the bottom of the shell, and the hole is called the bissel opening, of course. And as I explained just a minute ago, some clams also create dents or shallow burrows or deep burrows and things. And they do that by extending their pedal mantle tissue out of the bottom of the shell. So that's the other reason a lot of shells have a significant bissel opening. They need to have a big hole in the bottom of the shell for the pedal mantle tissue to come out. And for the byssus too. Anyway, let's look at some bissel openings now, and I'll follow up with one last term, which is used in the books, and that's inflation. Durasses typically have a weak bissel attachment when they're small. So they have a rather small bissel opening, like this, just a little slot in the bottom of the shell. Then when they get bigger, they oftentimes don't attach to anything. So they may close up the bissel opening with new shell material, and there's not even a slot anymore. Crocea is the champion, though, when it comes to bissel openings. Now, croceas are always strongly attached to the bottom of the holes they make, and the tissue that makes the hole has to reach out of the bottom of the shell to make the hole in the first place. So they have a really big bissel opening, like this. And the last thing I'll throw in here is inflation. Now, if you look at this young Durasso shell, it's not very fat. It's actually kind of thin. Look at this bigger, older Durasso. Look how fat that shell is. We'd say this one is strongly inflated. Okay, so that's enough about the shells. Now let's look at the upper mantle, which again is the visible fleshy structure you can see here. If you look at the upper mantle from above, you can easily see these two features. Now, these are the clam siphons, or siphonal openings, and they're where water enters and leaves the clam's body. The arrow on the left is pointing at a slot-like opening, and that's the inhalant siphon, and that's where water is drawn into the clam. And the arrow on the right, now that's pointing at the clam's exhalant siphon. That's where water leaves the clam's body. It looks more like a little chimney or a little tube. Now, point that out because sometimes the margin of the inhalant siphon is really distinctive, and oftentimes it can aid in identification. Now, for example, on the left is the inhalant siphon of a gigas. It's smooth all the way around, and that's always the case for this species. That's one of the clam's white gills you're looking at, by the way. Again, the water is drawn in through the inhalant siphon, and it passes over these gills before it passes out of the exhalant siphon. And if you look at this one, it's the inhalant siphon of a maxima. And you can see that the siphon's margin is lined with lots of little siphonal tentacles, and that many of those have tiny little branches on them. Again, this is typical of this species. And this one is the inhalant siphon of a squamosa. And just look at how big and fancy those tentacles are. And this last one is a durassa. Now again, we see some very fancy tentacles, and these are common for this species too. However, do note that not all squamosas and durasses have tentacles like these. These are common, but there are variations. Now, sometimes they're more point-like, and sometimes they're longer and skinnier, and sometimes they have more branches. So, again, we do have some variability. Uh, that being said, Gygus and Maxima, they never have tentacles like these. So those two could be ruled out if you were trying to figure out what species either of these other clams is. Squamosa and Durasa have very different shells, too, as you just saw a few minutes ago. So 
you wouldn't get those two confused either if you could see their shells. Now, as far as the exhalant siphon goes, the exit for water, there's not much of anything to say about it here. Now, this siphon never bears any kind of tentacles or anything like that, and it can change shape and size regardless of the species. Okay, next we've got giant clam eyes. Yes, they have eyes. Well, not all of them, but most of them do, and they're very simple eyes, but the clams that do have them can definitely see you coming. Let me show you a quick example. Yeah, so that was a good look at why taking pictures of these clams can be a serious pain in the rear sometimes. A, a lot of them absolutely will not cooperate, and you have to have a lot of patience. Not always an option when you're diving. Anyway, uh, the eyes can also vary from species to species, and these are the eyes of a Durasa. Notice that they just look kind of like flat black spots, and that they're well spaced along the edge of the upper mantle. On the other hand, this is a typical Maxima, which has a row of tightly spaced and sort of pimple-like eyes along the edge of its mantle. Now, you can see that they look like little bumps instead of being flat black spots. Some Maximas and some other clams can also have eyes on larger bumps and on little knobs or sort of little stalks, too. Now, these structures are called papillae, and some species may have them, while others never have them. And that's enough of that. Now you've got all the basic information that you need to uh, watch the rest of my videos and identify most giant clams down to the species level. Do note that I've also got a bunch of giant clam photo galleries online that you can look at, and they've collectively got hundreds of pictures of giant clams in them. You just need to go to jameswfathery.com and you'll find a link to the albums and a bunch of other stuff too. And of course, if you don't already have one, it would be awesome if you would get a copy of one of my books. I would really appreciate it. And with that said, I'm done. Thanks for watching.